So, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is July 18th, 2012, and we have some guests who are working together from different places on a, um, well, I, a Kickstarter project to, to get a documentary created um, mm -hmm. about a poet who they're going to tell us about here. Um, and um, so we have Daniel Glick with us. We have Denise Ben Briggle. How's that? That's that right. Close? Correct. That's Thank it. You. you hit it. Kim Sheehan and Chris Sloan is going to be joining us here. We had a little um, fun with finding the right place to join each other here. Um, but we're, we finally got started. Thank you all for meeting early. My, my son has a 21st birthday, wow. so I had to... <laughs> Change the time here, and it's discombobulated me a little bit, but um, it's okay. Let's focus in. Um, and um, Chris, are you with us yet? I didn't see you earlier. Let me just. All right. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Denise, um, why don't yeah. you introduce yourself? and introduce your colleagues here. Let's okay. start it that way. I'd be happy to. My name is Denise Van Briggle, as Paul said, and with that terrific pronunciation, appreciate that. It's a name that gets slaughtered pretty <laughs> often. So, um, But uh, I was director of the Capital Area Writing Project for about seven years, and uh, the capital of Pennsylvania. Capital, yes, Capital okay. Area Writing Project in Pennsylvania. There is another cop in a, uh, another state, but um, I was involved there for seven years, been involved with the writing project since 1988, and was an English teacher for many, many years, I recently retired. Um, I also did literacy coaching and was coordinator of secondary literacy for a large urban school district here in Pennsylvania. Um, my colleagues who are with me today, Daniel Glick is the filmmaker, and uh, we, I met Daniel through Jimmy Santiago Baca, the poet and writer uh, for whom this uh, show really is, um, is, is all about, or about whom this show is um, focusing on tonight. And um, Kim Sheehan is, um, there. is actually the person that Jimmy connected me to in order to work on the companion book that will accompany uh, the film. So Kim's from Florida. She's also a writing project person. And I'm going to let Daniel and Kim talk a little bit more about their own backgrounds and what they're bringing uh, to the program today. Sure. Go ahead, Daniel. OK. Well, I, I am not a teacher. I'm, the, I'm a filmmaker. And I've been working on this film about Jimmy's life, Jimmy Santiago Baca's life since last January, January of 2011. Uh, I've been working on it si with Gabriel Baca, who is one of Jimmy's sons. And at the beginning, it was us two. And as time rolled on, people appeared and joined the team, like Denise and uh, Kim and Rex uh, and so many others. There are maybe 20, 30, 40 people involved at different, <laughs> at different levels of engagement at this point. And uh, I first found out about the story about three years ago when I read Jimmy's book. It was recommended to me by a, an inmate in New York State Prison. And he said, if you want to understand prison more, you should read A Place to Stand. So I did, and it, you know, it knocked me over, floored me. <laughs> so I looked Jimmy up on the web and sent him an email, and that's how it all started. That's a good start. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Kim Sheehan, and I am from Port Charlotte, Florida. And I've been teaching for about 17 years. Um, currently, I'm working as the curriculum specialist for secondary literacy. And so I get to see the gamut of things. And I actually met Jimmy at a conference. He was presenting with someone uh, who I knew through another professional organization. And I was just enthralled with his speaking and what he had to say and his message. And during that time, he said he was looking for someone to do an action research with. And so I immediately just ran up to him after the presentation and said, pick me, you have to. And so we worked together on an action research with 9th, 10th, uh, and 11th grade writing uh, that spanned a year and a little bit more. And uh, that's how we got to know each other. And I just love his poetry and his writing. and 
I just said, I want to do something with you, and then this project came along, and here we are. So. Oh, Kim, it's so funny to hear Daniel speak and to hear you speak, and my story is so very similar. He spoke at the National Council of Teachers of English Secondary Luncheon in 2008. I had read the um, memoir in 2005. A colleague of mine highly recommended it. I read it. It um, For me, it was the most moving memoir mm -hmm. I had read. Uh, and still it holds that you know, yes. distinction, it really does. Um, on so many levels it, it spoke to me and, so, and it actually changed me to a, to a degree, much the same as everybody always talks about the writing project, changing right. them in a fundamental way. Jimmy's book did that for me. So I said to myself when I read it, I, one day I would meet this man. You know how you plant Absolutely. something in your brain and, and it becomes a reality? So. Several years later, I happened to be on the, um, I had a workshop at NCTE, and I went to the secondary luncheon and literally got there. I think I was, I felt like a groupie. I was like the first person there. I made, you know, I felt like prime, that too, yeah. prime table, you know, whatever. As soon as it was over, I literally just hightailed it. I remember cutting across the ballroom floor, and, and there were like 2,000 people there. I grabbed, you know, kind of all but grabbed them, and, and walked with him and said, I want you to come to my district. So I had That's the, exactly what I did. Yes, yeah, so I had the pleasure of having him uh, at the Harrisburg School District twice. Uh, he, was, he visited with us in 2009 and again in 2010. And I've seen him uh, work with middle school students, high school students, mm -hmm. groups of teachers and administrators, uh, college faculty and students and inmates. I'm a prison volunteer and so I've seen him in front of groups of um, male inmates and it's incredible the way he um, can command an audience. It's Absolutely. Just, uh, it, and especially all those different groups. So I thought, you know, mm -hmm. this guy's got something really special. I want to be uh, involved in some way. So he connected me to Daniel to help with fundraising and then connected me to Kim to work on the book and I think he has this uncanny ability to bring people so together people and together. sort of mesh and blend. So that's um, yeah, really kind of nice. Now everybody will be tackling him trying to <laughs> try as long as they get him to come to their districts. I guess that's a good thing. So uh, yeah, your enthusiasm is uh, <laughs> infectious, i got to say. Um, but in some of the writing you've done about this, you said it's a service project, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. the Kickstarter project that mm -hmm. you're doing. And just in case somebody only listens to the first five minutes of uh, this, this mm -hmm. wonderful broadcast, um, let's make sure we get that right at the top and then sure. we'll, get, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll mention at the end. But what is the Kickstarter project? And then we'll get more deeply into Jimmy's life a little bit maybe and some of the great. themes. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Daniel? Yeah, well, <coughs> we've been working on the film since January of 2011, uh, mm -hmm. January last year, and we are very far along in the project. We've done 70 hours of interviews, 20 hours with Jimmy, and uh, about 50 with about 30 other people who have been involved in his life, whether it be poets who wrote him letters when he was learning how to write, or former cellmates, or prison administrators, uh, his sister, cousins. So we've, we've compiled a lot and we've put it together into a rough assembly, but in order to finish the film, we need to raise the money to, to complete it. And that's why we're doing this Kickstarter. And as far as why it's a service, it's a service because Jimmy's story really has the capacity to change people's lives, mm -hmm. unquestionably. In, and his mm -hmm. memoir and his poetry and his workshops are proof of that. They're, when I was with him, I... Uh, you know, last year working on the project, I would see, I, I would occasionally see these letters that would come to him. I remember one really vividly that a man who's still in prison wrote Jimmy saying, because I read your book, A Place mm -hmm. to Stand, I left the Aryan Brotherhood. And wow. doing that in prison is almost a death sentence. And he did it when he was still in prison because Jimmy's story allowed him to reconnect with a part of himself that he had discarded and suppressed. So it has that power and that potency mm -hmm. to serve people, and his story does. And this creating the film will create the possibility of many, many more people witnessing it and listening to it and, and mm -hmm. encountering Jimmy mm -hmm. and his story and his work. And, and then there's the programming and the, and the book 
that Denise and Kim are working on, which will be designed to expand on any spark of transformation mm -hmm. that the film and Jimmy's story creates. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, so, the Kickstarter website is a crowdfunding website where many people through small donations fund a project together. So we, we're, our goal is $50,000 by the end of July, and we're, about, we're at about $30,000 right now, and we have 13 days left. And we are, yeah, we're encouraging people to contribute. It's tax deductible. And you can get there by visiting our website, aplacetostandmovie.com. And there's a link right there on the front page. And we'll obviously put a link to it, too. So if you want to follow back on this webcast and stuff, um, or podcast, you'll, we'll, we'll find it that way. Chris, do you want to jump in here? Um, sure. <laughs> um, so my name is Chris Sloan. I teach English in Salt Lake City, Utah. And, uh, you know, I uh, was uh, interested in this because of the story. Like, you know, everybody's talked about, uh, it's a powerful story of someone who, you know, someone in the, in the trailer says that he had a 1% of a 1% chance of actually, you know, making something of his life in, in the situation he was in when he was in prison and, you know, his background and everything. And, and I think it's an important lesson for my students that, um, you know, how people make things out of their lives. And his story just sounds so authentic, coupled with the fact that I've taught some of his stuff before in class. Um, I feel like it's, you know, a real sweet spot as far as, you know, introducing a really important story into my curriculum mm -hmm. this year, uh, and especially because I'm in, you know, the desert south, southwest, you know, I have some Hispanic students that um, are always hungry for, um, you know, those really strong role models. Mm -hmm. And would it be worthwhile to give a quick rundown of what Jimmy's story is for the people yes. who aren't familiar? Uh, I can do that. Uh, yes, please. That would be great. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's... So it, the story, in a nutshell, is how Jimmy learned how to write, read and write, while he was in prison in the 1970s, and how that process of discovering poetry while incarcerated absolutely transformed his life and, mm -hmm. and saved, him, saved his humanity. And the, the, that's the general arc of the story. It, it follows his childhood, which was extremely traumatic, abandoned when he was three years old and homeless and in and out of orphanages and foster homes and homeless and eventually dealing drugs in Arizona, sentenced to five years in Arizona State Prison in the 1970s, which was one of the most violent prisons in the country at that time. Can I interrupt one second? Yeah, yeah. You skipped over schooling there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. Well, well, yeah, because he didn't have any. <laughs> yeah, not barely. Well. He, he, he went to, he, he, there were classes in the orphanage that he went to, basic ABCs, but, and he went to middle school for maybe a semester, but he was not engaged at all. He, he could barely read and write. And the teachers shamed him because he didn't know how to participate fully. He, and he was a minority in a in a white in a predominantly white school, so it was. Uh, so it, it, he was never drawn to education when he was a kid, and he, mm -hmm. so he basically had none when he went into prison. And he was a, he was functionally illiterate when he entered prison. So I wonder what it's like for him to go back into schools now. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's amazing to watch. I can mm -hmm. tell you that. Um, we spent, we went to three different high schools and spent time with kids across all different age groups. And he mesmerized them from the moment he opened his mouth to speak with them. Had them all writing within a 20 minute span. And uh, he was even kind enough to Skype with us later on and do individual critiques around a writing workshop with one group of kids that really just truly kept trying to write and, and uh, make their writing better because of his visit. And uh, when Jimmy was here in uh, Florida, we, I said to him, you know, there's a kid who so wanted to see you, but he got sentenced to a DJJ facility, which is one of our juvenile justice facilities. He goes, is it close? Can we go? 
and I said, I'll make a phone call because it was one of my schools that I oversee. And they brought together 20 kids, and he walked in and did his magic with 20 of these kids, had us all almost in tears, just talking about what they wanted out of life. And, and I know many of them left there changed. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. You want to continue, <laughs> Daniel? Well, I, yeah. Well, he, sorry. No, no. That's it's an important <laughs> part of the story. I mean, it's, it sets up that he was illiterate and he had and he hated education really because it, it didn't offer him anything. Mm -hmm. uh, he was marginalized and criminalized and <clears throat> neglected and shamed uh, because he wasn't literate. But when he was on the inside. He, he engaged with the violence of the prison and became a, an enemy of the administration because he was fighting all the time. Eventually was thrown in the hole, solitary confinement, mm -hmm. where he spent, well, he went in and out a lot, but, but eventually he was able to reconnect with his childhood by remembering what it was like before his parents left him and time with his grandparents, and he rediscovered his humanity, and in that, desire to improve himself and, and he finally came to the realization mm -hmm. that maybe education is the way to do this because that's, so what, that's what I hear. Solitary confinement for a long time or you said it, some? You know? It was, yeah, it was 30, well initially it was 30 day stretches wow. and he would go in and then he'd come out and he'd get into another fight, he'd go in again and uh, eventually he asked the administration for education and they refused to give it to him. So he went on a solitary work strike and that's when they threw him in solitary confinement for uh, a year. Well, it, a, a single cell in one of the most dangerous parts of the prison. And when he was there, he got a letter from a Christian missionary which is what started everything. And he wrote back with the help of his neighbor uh, lending him a dictionary and helping him to scribble, to helping him to figure out what what words were, and you know the beginnings of his ABCs were coming back from the orphanage days. So he was able to cobble a letter together, and that just unleashed this torrent of writing, which never has not stopped since. <laughs> you know, it, it, the story uh, before paralleled it, but even more so now. You know, Malcolm X's story of his literacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's really similar, and mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that because uh, it's really striking how literacy, you know, saves people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I guess, um, Daniel, did, did you want to continue on with the story? I was actually just going to interject. I, um, the reason that Jimmy's book was recommended to me is that I uh, adopted a dog, and I do adopted this dog off the Internet through Pet Finder, had no idea where the I fell in love with this dog and turns out I got a note back and they said this dog is in a Virginia prison uh, so it was a wow. cell dog I had no clue and my husband and I went to Virginia picked up the dog met the inmate who mm. talk about uncanny coincidences mm. is from he's in Virginia but is from this area where I, I he grew up in Philly and actually lived in the town where I taught for many, many years. Um, so we had this immediate connection over place and we started to correspond back and forth. And this would have been in 2000, I don't know, five when I, 2004 when I adopted the dog, 2005 when this college professor uh, friend recommended his, his work. But at any rate, one of the reasons she recommended the book is she said maybe your friend that you've been corresponding to who trained your dog would get something out of this book. And he read the book and he goes back and reads it and rereads it. And every time he rereads it, he tells me, you know, he sees something new. Every time I read the book, I see something new or I'm, uh, it's Daniel and I talk about being cracked open in, in a new and different mm -hmm. way. So he sees... Um, and I, I won't use the inmate's name, but he sees this hope for his future uh, because he's read this book and has dipped back into it again and again. And so I think if someone like uh, my friend can see that sense of hope that's 
young people that are in high school maybe headed down the wrong path or even individuals that read the book for pleasure can find a new path that's more positive and um, will lead them to a better future. And so sort of this um, piece of me wants to contribute to that. So that's why I personally am so <coughs> invested in the in his book, in Daniel telling this story in a cinematic way, I really believe it has the potential to change the hearts and minds of lots of people um, in this world um, in, in a very broad sense. Yeah, unquestionably. I mean, it's the, the story from the point he learns how to read and write, I mean, it's, it's remarkable how consumed he becomes with literacy and writing and reading and that's all he wants to do and the, he's tested by the prisons there are inmates who are challenging him about you know we don't want you to read and write in here you know get out of my get out of this cell and he is able to commit he was able to commit to his self-improvement commit mm -hmm. to his transformation and to re and his humanity and he saw that writing was a way to do that to guarantee his survival and to evolve and mm -hmm. to heal past wounds. So the that's that and the story as the story goes, he used that momentum and wrote for four years and eventually was corresponding with all these poets on the outside and having his book having his poems published in Mother how Jones did, magazine. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. uh, how did he connect with those poets? Yeah. Well, it's, mm -hmm. it came from the first person he ever wrote to, that Christian missionary. Mm -hmm. uh, who, their correspondence lasted for a while, and this missionary was a poet as well, and a big fan of poetry. And he, he and Jimmy would share poems with each other. And Harry was this missionary's name, and he said, Jimmy, I love your poetry. I'm going to send it to all these other people. I'm going to send it to other poets that I know and because he knew that Jimmy was just hungry to communicate with other people now that he finally could through writing. So Harry put him in touch with these other poets mm -hmm. and as Jimmy learned more and more about poetry in the world, he started submitting poems as well to different magazines and I think that's how he got connected to Mother Jones. Mm -hmm. He submitted there and Denise Levertoff, the poetry editor, she yeah was really moved by Jimmy's writing and they struck up a correspondence and a friendship so it was a very organic mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. and and that those friendships are really really were instrumental in him getting out within five years because they advocated for him his, and his release mm -hmm. and the, where the prison warden really hated Jimmy because of his rebellion uh, and it was. It would have been very unlikely if he didn't have these poets on the outside advocating for him that he would have gotten out when he did. But he did. But he did in the end. And, so yeah. one of the, you know, I'm, I I want to know more about Jimmy and the uh, and the poetry and the story. I I'm also interested in. Uh, I mean, your interest in the prison systems here. I mean. Mm -hmm. Was it just a dog, Denise, that, uh, or had you an interest well, before that? And, no, it actually, yeah. Um, yeah uh, and Daniel, you mentioned also, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's where it started for me. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about yeah. prisons and incarceration, and is that part of the story that you're trying to tell in the documentary too? Like, uh, what's happening in American prison, the penal well, system? Where? Yeah. Well, it's it is the setting for the film. The, the film is not, I mean, it's unavoidable that the story is, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a story that takes place in prison. But we're not focused on, on how destructive prison is. I think in w hearing Jimmy tell his story, that becomes really obvious really quickly, just how destructive the prison system mm -hmm. is and how inimical it is to growth and transformation and any kind of self-improvement. Mm -hmm. I think... But you're not doing a pro-public um, investigation. No, no, no. No, we're, no, it's, no it's, a very, it's a very personal story. 
and we'll, we'll, have, we'll have contextual pieces that talk a little bit about the prison system in Arizona, but, you know, in the sense that, okay, Arizona never really cared too much about rehabilitation, so that is, that's explanation for why they didn't really want to give Jimmy education. So we'll talk, we talk about the prison system, and the film is without question a jumping off point. It will be for discussion about how, that's how broken the right. system is today. But, right. but for me, it's, it's about impacting people individually by using mm -hmm. Jimmy's story as a mm -hmm. tool for uh, individual inspiration. Absolutely. Because I got uh, just to continue the thought a little more from my perspective. Um, when I show the movie to kids in the South Bronx, they're going to have family members who are mm -hmm. in jail and and wonder, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I know I I'm, I'm wondering what kind of impact it'll have on on their kind of thinking about those people, you know, mm -hmm. their relatives and so forth and friends. Mm -hmm. but, just a thought. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it, 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 it doesn't glorify prison. <laughs> Jimmy's story yeah. is not a glorification. It's very raw, very real. I mean, Jimmy talks a lot about his fears <laughs> inside and his anger and his pain. And there's no, yeah, there's no romance in it. I mean, he, he was broken. You know, the prison system broke him down and it broke so many people around him down and I think in hopefully in communicating that at some level it may de-romanticize the prison experience mm -hmm. because when you're on the outside and you're you hear about you know gang warfare and and you know mm -hmm. and the convict code there is a romance associated with that and I think that's why all these prison reality shows are so popular mm -hmm. But there's very there are very few stories that I've seen that humanize prisoners in a very real, authentic way, and I think that's the value in this story is that we see we see Jimmy as a person. He's not a he's not a criminal. He's not a convict. He's a person, and all the other people who are with him in prison are people, and and they're not there, and, and it's not a it's not a something to aspire to. Right. But also, um, you know, I'm, I'm noticing this story of Harry and wondering, you know, maybe I could uh, write to a prisoner and, you know, so there's, mm -hmm. there's that example yeah. that's here too. Mm -hmm. Right. I've carried on the correspondence with, uh, with the inmate that I've been writing to for now since 2004 and it's, um, you know, we still correspond with one another, not as often as we did in the beginning when, um, you know, our friendship was new and fresh, but um, certainly it's something that I, I highly encourage. I um, felt as though I gave a lot, uh, and supported him in many ways that, you know, he was unable to, to reach out to others uh, to achieve that level of support, not financial in any um, any stretch of the imagination, but uh, certainly it was a, a supportive uh, relationship, which I think uh, benefited both of us to a degree. So I you know, encourage others to, to search that out as well. And in terms of my own prison involvement, I, in addition to the writing, I then became, you know, Jimmy's story, knowing Jimmy, um, seeing his humanity and what, a, mm -hmm. what an amazing person he is just underscored for me that people that are in prison uh, regardless of all the things that they may have done, some, you know, tremendously despicable, all of that, um, at the core level, they are still human beings. And that spoke to me and reignited sort of this social justice fire that had been burning in me or smoldering, I would say, from high school. Um, and as I approached my retirement, I thought, you know, this is what I want to do with my time. And so I'm all in. <laughs> And and that, and what you were saying, Paul, we we do want to, when the film is finished, we have Denise and Kim working on these the programming and this accompanying this book that will be used to help educate uh, and inspire and follow up on the on the on the film and the message of the film. But at the same time, we'll, we'll be developing, we'll create we'll we'll create the possibility for people to do things like strike up a prison pen pal, mm -hmm. uh, 
correspondence <laughs> or uh, yeah, or, or just build bridges between the outside world and behind the walls to in create to give resources to ex-cons on how to reintegrate into society, it, create support structures or, or help lead them to support structures. So there, there is definitely a lot we want to do connected to the film and we'll make alliances with groups who already have those structures in place so that we can maximize the impact. And I think what's interesting too is, is along those lines, even if you not had that prison experience or know someone or whatever it is, this goes so so far beyond that that it reaches out to all of humanity. Um, just reading the poems and knowing Jimmy's journey kind of helps you to do a little introspection and kind of do some self-reflection where you're kind of looking at different qualities and things about your own life and makes you ask some hard questions and so I think that this is a story that, while that is a, obviously the focus, it's going to reach so many more people. Yeah, unquestionably. <laughs> I, I, I just remembered that you have a, a, queued up a video to show us, but, and we'll get there. But here's, I wanted to get back Jimmy to Jimmy's story a little bit. I, could. Jimmy gets out of jail um, after about five years, did you say? And yeah. Now, did were his? I, I'll be some. I'll represent somebody. It's not hard. Who doesn't know Jimmy's poetry? Um, can you? Can did did his early poetry reflect some of the anger and violence? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. Well, Denise and Kim have been. We, when, when Gabe and I were working on the film, we uncovered literally hundreds of unpublished poems that Jimmy had written when he was in prison. And, and Gabe and I sorted, sort, went through them and sorted some of the, some of the most poignant ones mm -hmm. out. And so Denise and Kim can talk about that because that's mm -hmm. what they're building this book around. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. Um, want to address that first? Basically, um, I was sent this file with these 77 poems, and they spanned some of that time. And um, as Daniel had said, they'd never been published or put out there. And then I got an email from Jimmy that says, I'm connecting you with Denise. You two <laughs> need to work together. You're going to love each other. And I think this will be a great project. And we connected um, via email and through Jimmy and on Skype. And then we started looking at these poems and um, just really immersed ourselves in this poetry and found that it really does have, um, it does tell a story in those. And so we began to order them. You want to talk about that, Denise? Well, I, I just think it's, uh, again, another uncanny process. And as writers, I assume many of the people that are listening are, uh, in fact, writers. But Kim and I approached this as uh, we, we just kind of dug in and said, okay, let's just immerse ourselves into these poems and let's try to order them in a way that we think makes sense to independently. She ordered them and I ordered them and it was unbelievable how many similarities we had when we compared our lists. And there were some, um, some quotes from uh, some folks that he had written uh, to in prison and we were sort of pairing independently again, pairing these uh, quotes with poems that we thought you know, might match it. And again, we had these perfect matches when we were, particularly the beginning and the end. So we thought, uh -huh. okay, we really have something here. We have these, you know, these, the bookends. And so uh, we've worked, I think, um, really well together using yeah. technology. I mean, we had never met. And I went to a vacation, and she drove down, and we spent an entire day writing in coffee shops and restaurants <laughs> until they kicked us out. But um, so the process of writing has been... Uh, you know, really, really, I think very, very nice for both of us. And we're both writing project uh, folks, and we did not even realize that, I don't think, until Jimmy until we were halfway that. through. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's cool. Um, and some of the themes of those poems. Mm. Well, we, we've kind of uh, we've assigned some divisions to the poetry. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As we talked about it. 
we, be, we started and we saw that there was this group of very dark, angry, just poetry. Mm -hmm. And um, we've divided it into four uh, different sections. Mm -hmm. And the first one was about the dehumanizing process that was imposed upon Jimmy and how he dealt with it. And he just recorded it with such intensity that you could feel it. Um, mm -hmm. Then we, we went to a second section that was uh, really journeying inward, kind of hitting that darkest moment when the decisions you make are going to choose the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And then you want to talk about the other couple well, yeah, I was going to say, and then the, 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 the other two sections are really sort of um, lighter in a way because after that, you know, sort of hitting rock bottom and making that decision, as uh, as Kim indicated. There's this uh, we we call it illuminating outward because actually you can begin to see. It's almost like somebody swimming to the surface. You can almost feel in the poems. Uh, you know, you're getting closer and closer to um, you know to getting back to participating in the world in a in a real. Uh, you know, way rather than uh, you know being incarcerated in this dark and obviously in the hole and and that kind of thing. But you really feel that. And then the last one, the last section, is really about the rehumanization process because uh, just as he was dehumanized when when he was first sent to prison, you can see this rehumanization happening. And it was really. His doing, uh, which I think is re is very very important in the in the poetry, that it's not you know somebody came in and 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 said you're going to you know rehumanize. It was a process that he went through, and I think what we have put together really does reflect the journey that uh, yes. he had uh, while he was there. To from our perspective, obviously we were not uh, we were not part of that. Yeah. And the power of the literacy was just, it, it just comes through every piece that you read. Yeah, Jimmy's, Jimmy's writing is, is un incredibly raw. Mm -hmm. uh, and he writes a lot about his experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as, as he's been through, well, I mean, I think for me what was what's so striking about some of the poetry that we uncovered mm -hmm. is while he was in prison in one of the worst places, he would write about how much he loved life mm -hmm. and how, mm -hmm. how he was in joy and in ecstasy, mm -hmm. in, in love with a blade of grass mm -hmm. outside of his window. Mm -hmm. I think that he has those poems, then he has the absolute anger of being treated like less than a human being, of, of seeing unspeakable violence mm -hmm. being committed by other prisoners, mm -hmm. uh, by guards. And so there's... There's a whole range, it's the full human spectrum of emotions Absolutely. that flow through his poetry, and I think that's why they're so captivating, that's why they're so powerful. Mm -hmm. how, how many books has he published at this point? Um, no it's, it's over 20. I was going to say, in the 20s, I've read them all, um, I've read I, everything that's currently, you know, still available, I've, I've read, and, you know, it, it's definitely in the 20s, for sure. And I wanted to say something about the poetry, um, running the gamut of the full emotion, I mean, everything available to you. I think the memoir does that, too, and I think Absolutely. that's one of the reasons why it appealed to me uh, so much, because I could see passion and compassion and, you know, the brutality and, you know, themes of abandonment and all sorts of things. Um, that we as humans experience, um, some of us a little more than others, unfortunately, but it's a, all of those things are available to the reader in the memoir, as well as all of his poems. And like Denise said, uh, he, and this, this is a quote from the trailer, one of the guys in the trailer, Jimmy rehabilitated himself in spite of the prison. Absolutely, yes. Not because of it. And that's a good and that's a good distinction to make. And it was his writing and his literacy that rehabilitated him. Uh, right. and, and who, but or, or more specifically, the writing and the literacy was a tool and a vehicle. Mm -hmm. like that, it, it was him. He rehabilitated himself, but he used literacy as a tool, tool. to do that. To discover his, to rediscover himself. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. 
So once he gets out, um, can you sketch in? I mean, is there more in the movie? <laughs> there, what what happens? How does he uh, get known? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. bring us up to the to the memoir, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the the film will predominantly focus on that childhood to his release from prison. Okay. So that's. But we are going to address kind of little give a little bit of a summary of how he got to where he is today and it was within a year of his release he was published by New Directions uh, which is a big publishing house in New York and that was his first collection of poetry that he was working on when he was in prison with Denise Levertov who was the Mother Jones editor and she was a New, Di uh, New Directions woman and so that launched him onto the stage immediately after his release from prison. And he's, but he struggled. <clears throat> there was no, really no support system for him when he got out. He had no family, no friends on the outside. All, all he wanted to do was write poetry, and of course, that's not really supported. So he, he fell back into crime, and... Got to tell my tell my 19 year old son in college, but <laughs> <laughs> who thinks that's what he wants to do? Oh, well, it, well it, it took Jimmy. Jimmy has been able to support himself through poetry, but it took him 35 years, you know, to do it. And it was for him, it was a process of sticking with his passion of poetry, and then when he when he had a family, when he had his first two sons and got married. I think those, those two pieces, family and poetry, are what grounded him and allowed him to, uh, and, and gave him the courage and the conviction to leave crime for good and, and do writing workshops and write and go a very, you know, kind of very unconventional, <coughs> on-the-edge mm -hmm. artist's mm -hmm. life. And that, and then, and over time, he, he just wrote more and more and more and more and had more books published. And then in the 1990s, he wrote this book, or he wrote this movie called Blood In, Blood Out, which was a really, mm -hmm. really big film in the Hispanic communities. And that launched him to another level. And then 10 years after that, he wrote A Place to Stand, which, again, was was another level. So mm -hmm. it's been a, a long it's been a it's been a long process of evolution since his release thirty five years ago. Mm -hmm. And now he's living in a cabin in northern New Mexico <laughs> and writing deep in the woods. Mm -hmm. Good for him. <laughs> um I, do you want to try to show the um uh movie clip that you have? What, mm -hmm. Is it a promo? Whatever you'd want to call it. Right. Would you, Daniel, Let's do it. Do you want to do that, or would you like me to? Oh, you can go ahead. Do that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I did. I did a little practicing, you know, on type A. <laughs> Let's see here. Let me see if I can. Oh, and what we all need to do to watch the video mm -hmm. is press the YouTube button at the top. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Great. Which, but don't do anything there. I hope Denise is Okay, I'm still looking. Right. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I want the extended trailer. It's not popping up, Daniel, and I know you. Um, well, there's the teaser trailer, but I can't find the extended. I know you opened it up the other day for me. Oh, it should right. be. Let me, let me here. see my... Does it have a different uh, title? Perhaps? No, I think that's <clears> it. <throat> I'd like you to see the extended trailer. We could pause it and uh, wherever you would like, Paul. But no, this one I, I think know. we could probably just play. But let's okay. see if we can find it. We can wait. I mean, yeah. Chris, do you have any questions or thoughts or? <laughs> yes. Um, I had uh, while we're doing this um, a question about you know involvement in the Kickstarter thing. And so let's say somebody's listening and they're thinking, uh, yeah, you know, I'd like to get that video or I'd like to somehow participate. Uh, can you talk just quickly about the different levels? Like, you, you know, you take donations of... You guys have a lot of levels. levels. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's how... That's how, that's how they instruct you to do it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you create... You make a donation and for each... There are many, many different levels of donations that one can make. Uh, that's 
and you get a reward. They're called rewards. So you get rewards if you donate a certain amount. And so for us, we created, I don't know, there may be 20 different reward levels. Mm -hmm. And it starts at, at $1, you get a video of Jimmy reading a poem in northern New Mexico. And then mm -hmm. at $25, you get a DVD of the film when we finish it. $50, you get a copy of Blood In, Blood Out, uh, signed by Jimmy. And then... 75 is a uh, is a prison is a poem that he writ, wrote in prison, reproduced, signed by him. So we ha and it goes all the way up to ten thousand dollars. So you what do you get for ten thousand? Come on, ten thousand is you get it. You get it. You get it. All of the above. Uh, all of the above. I know. Every other every other reward you get a a producer credit in the film. You could. Basically, have all access to everything involved in the film. So you have about thirty thousand dollars so far. And you're looking for twenty thousand more, more by the mm -hmm. end of this month. By the end of is that right? Yeah. Yes, that's right. July. Yeah. And um, is that, you must know, or do you know, like your contributions? Have they been on the twenty-five dollar range, or did you get some big ones in there? Or? Mm -hmm. Just curious how it works. Yeah. Well, it, it's. It, most of them have been smaller contributions. They're, most of the contributions, I think, have been around between 25 to 50 bucks. Uh, but, but we've had bigger ones. We've had a number of bigger uh -huh. contributions to push us forward. So a couple $2,500 contributions, several $1,000 contributions. Nice. And yeah, right. and so those those have been yeah, within right. within two hours of launching the thing we got a, our first donation was a $2,500 donation <laughs> that's so that encouraging was, yeah so yeah. I, was, I was all panicked when we started and then that was that, that came in to reassure me mm -hmm. that there was support cool. for the project have, that, any, have any of you done a Kickstarter before? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I have oh, okay. yeah well, we did one for a place to stand last year oh okay uh, and that mm -hmm. is what allowed us to get to complete all of our, all the interviews of the film, mm -hmm. so we traveled around the country for uh, for two right. months, get doing mm -hmm. research and collecting interviews, and we were able to raise seventy five hundred last year. Mm -hmm. So we cool. we are our goal is ten times that this time. Uh, <laughs> so are you getting it? That's we great. Are. We we yeah. also just added, which I'm excited about, and um, I hope it it happens. We added a fifteen hundred. Setting and work uh, in a one-day writers' workshop with um, with Jimmy prior to the New Mexico premiere. So we're hoping uh, that flies. Cool. So it looks like the video has been queued up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did I, did I Daniel, you it? did it. No, no, no. Nah. I'm glad you found it. That's Excellent, because cool. it's not showing up on my end. Thank so, you. Does everybody see it? Mm -hmm. Chris, you see it? Yeah. We good. Okay. So somebody hit play. <laughs> 